Hi, this is Bill Joyce, and I'm the broker at Charter Home in Sacramento and a blogger at survivingtheamericandream.org. While I'm an advocate for home ownership in general, I've seen the kind of pain and suffering a poor home choice can have on a family's finances, marriage, health, and overall happiness. I believe the oversold and underdefined image of dream home encourages people to spend far too much money for the wrong kinds of things. Buying a house doesn't get you the life you imagine or the time to live it any more than joining a gym will make you fit. It takes discipline and effort to create the things you dream of. You can't simply buy them. Join me while I interview experts in various fields like financial planning, marriage and family therapy, career counselors, life coaches, as well as happy and unhappy homeowners willing to share their hard-earned wisdom. Today's guest is Laura Bonarigo, a divorce coach and a life coach helping people in times of transition true up their values with their budgets, making practical choices while crafting their best lives. Laura, please tell us a little about yourself. My name is Laura Von Rigo, and I'm a certified divorce coach, and I'm also a certified life coach. And what I do is help people consider the ramifications around deciding to leave a marriage, get divorced, and create a new life. And help them make a life based on their values and hold them accountable to being who they are when they're at their best. I'm curious. I I, um, would you say that divorce is handled differently by men and women? Do you see a a gender difference in how uh, men and women approach divorce and planning um, that new life? Well, let's start with the first part of that. How do men and women uh, handle dealing with divorce? Let's let's start with that because uh, the next piece, which is creating a new life, that's a separate topic. So there are stages in divorce and um, I think that people can't begin healing until the decree is signed. And I think it takes a lot longer than we all anticipate. Uh, so in terms of how men and women approach divorce, it's difficult to make a general statement because we, as a culture, uh, see an, an incredible amount of divorce. And funny enough, it, 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 the statistics haven't gone up. They haven't gone up since the 80s. It's approximately 46% of all first marriages, 65% of all second marriages, and 75% of all third marriages, which tells me that we need divorce coaches because people are not doing their healing work. So when someone's considering divorce, um, what we see is everybody's doing it, so it can't be that hard. It's a simple thing. We're all doing it. It's all part of our culture. And we're forgetting, until we talk with someone who's been through divorce, that it's a deeply personal experience. So everyone's divorce is very unique, just like their marriage is very unique, just like the way they made love to their partner is very unique. Everyone is different. And so I always say it's incredibly common, but deeply personal. So the generality is tough to make. Um, but by and large, women are more emotional. They think about it longer. They may have been considering divorce significantly longer than men. And one of the things that in our culture culture um, prevents women from filing is their financial and um, parenting concerns. If there are children, of course, a mother is very concerned about the well-being of their family and women make less money than men. So that's an enormous uh, issue for women in our culture. And it is very sexist. Um, it's unfortunately also very true. Men, on the other hand, tolerate uh, an uncomfortable situation because typically, again, it's this is typical, uh, men have leave the home every day and go to work or they work from home. They have a uh, they have uh, a status in their their worldview. They have a responsibility. They have they get a paycheck. They're not necessarily stay at home fathers. Men are also more tolerant of affairs. And uh, more men are willing to have affairs than women. Uh, 
And of course, that's all dependent. Again, these are gross generalities. This is not um, specific. But affairs can sustain a marriage a lot longer because men are willing to tolerate what's not happening in their home. Again, not wanting to break up the family, keeping it together for the children, keeping it together for the community. So that's our first shift there. I think I answered your question about how men and women approach divorce. You did. Okay, great. So in terms of men and women healing, um, so I love working with men and I love working with women. I think it's incredibly important for a person going through what I call our modern day rite of passage to get the kind of support that is going to keep them growing and not mired in the past. Um, sure, it's great. We should look in the past. We should understand the conditioning and the circumstances that caused us to act and behave and break boundaries and break agreements and break a marriage. Fine. Terrific. Once you understand that, you have to go forward. And the healing takes much, much longer. And I always get men that come in and they go, okay, here we are. First month, we're done. And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem, honey. And then a year later, we're working together. Because healing takes a lot longer than we realize. And uh, just because we understand something intellectually doesn't mean that we know how to change the behavior. And also, I think it's really, really important. Um, I look at divorce as an opportunity to grow and an opportunity to become who you're supposed to be. We often talk about what are we doing here? What is this lifetime about? And if a couple are not growing within their marriage, if the agreements aren't stable, if the boundaries are broken, if the uh, values are off, then they need to separate. And they need to go become who they're supposed to be, get back into integrity, chew up to their value system, and have support and accountability along the way. So for me, um, I think that most men haven't done self work, self, um, most men haven't done self reflective work. It's not typically something they will do, even though more and more men are doing it. And I know men who are, uh, day laborers and blue collar workers. And I know men who are white collar workers who are willing to be self reflective. Not all men are. And I find that when I give them support and encouragement and a task, their competitiveness kicks in and they really want to succeed. So I call them coachable. Um, women are much more amenable and open to talking about the emotionality and the problems and this and that. Funny enough, they're not always coachable. They're not always accountable. They're more used to the drama of the story instead of uh, stepping out of the drama, looking at their lives objectively, taking responsibility for their decisions, owning where they want to go, and doing the work to get there. So it's very different. It's very different. And I think it has to do with more of just how we are made up. You know, that's so interesting. And making a big decision like buying a home, I think that what you just described and how, how men and women will differ in dealing with something like divorce and dealing with a big decision with big consequences um, is really true. I, and I think uh, perhaps uh, sh shining some light on that for people who aren't necessarily thinking about that um, as they make this decision so to feed some communication, get people talking a little bit about it could be really useful. So I'm interested in, in the, the next part of that, which is that moving forward part after divorce. How do people approach that life planning? Um, and, I, and the reason I, this is really close to this is because buying a home is a life planning exercise uh, rather than a, a consumer purchase. You, are, you need to do the things that uh, – uh, you need to find the qualities in a house – that support the things that are important in your life, that support whether that's your marriage and your children, uh, saving for and building for a, a, some financial independence and retirement. And the house is so big in terms of the money and time and impact on lives that it really is a life planning exercise. So back to you then, um, moving forward, how men and women would perhaps uh, evaluate the life planning 
after divorce, starting fresh. Are there any generalities there that you could share that you've observed? Well, I think as people are moving forward and healing from the trauma of divorce, the most important thing is to true up their values with a budget. That's the hardest part. People don't like the budget. They don't like the word discipline. <laughs> I always have to tell people that discipline comes from the word disciple. So really it's a, it's, it's self care, self care word. It's a good thing. We want to do that. Um, but, uh, Your discipline does sound hard. It does. It sounds it like has, a chore. It, yeah. yeah. It's a horrible, horrible uh, connotation in our culture. But I coach a lot of people, not just people going through divorce on uh, budgeting and values. And what's their purpose? Because, look, at the end of the day, math doesn't lie. You're either in credit card debt, you either have to pay off your attorney, you have to save for your retirement, you need long-term care. You know, it just doesn't lie. Your paycheck is only so big. Uh, you know, you need a second job. These are reality. These are, um, these are things in reality. So we have to true up to that. And people go through divorce in such a naive, imaginary way that they're so astounded by the behavior. I'm like, what are you astounded about? That's what you were living with for 30 years or something. You know, like, really? <laughs> Can you look at this? So I have to, uh, I bring in a lot of humor, but I also really true them up to your values. What you want cost money in our culture. That's our society. What you want has a price tag. So with that being said, you have to first start with a budget. That's, Not. that's big right there. The, the, um, the idea of values and money. Um, and like your, your phrase there, true up, you know, mm -hmm. it's getting, getting very real with what that means. And that's, you know, when it comes to uh, buying a house, um, it's a very exciting purchase. It's, it's, it's big. And there's a lot of fantasy that, that goes around that. I think people imagine, um, you know, the life they're going to have after they move into this big, beautiful new house as though that would solve problems, you know, that already exist. And it's, and it's a fantasy. It's, um, um they're buying the life they want and the time to live it. And, and in reality, uh, they could well be undermining the life they they want and the time to live it. So I'm laughing because you know I'm an actress and I've been an actress for many many years. So I just want to I just want to press pause for a minute and wrap my arms around any couple that thinks that you know they're caught up in the fantasy of it all because they don't stand a chance. <laughs> of course oh. they're caught up in the fantasy. Look at look at our world. Look at yeah. What we do, look at the world that I get paid to act in. We, we generate fantasies. You know, look at any commercial around the holidays. Look at yeah. anything. Every purchase is going to give you the life that you want as if that's supposed to be the thing that creates it for you. If I buy that house and I live in that neighborhood, I'm going to look like this because they're always going to lose weight or they're going to get really big muscles or they're going to have that fancy car or they're going to have the 2.5 kids. You know, the whole thing, you gotta, you just gotta, you got to love on people because, come on, they don't stand a chance. Of course they're in fantasy. It has nothing to do with what they can afford or what their values are, unless it is, unless they've done their work, unless they know they can afford that house, unless they know as a couple that's where they're going, unless they have a life plan. What I have found is most of my clients became my clients whether it is as a life coach or as a divorce coach, because they went about living their life by default. They're not awake. They're not conscious. They're just doing things by rote, the way mom and dad did, or the way they were told to by their teachers, or the way they were told to by their parents, or by their boss, or by their friends, by their community. How many people have you heard say, I want a baby because everybody around me is having a baby? So there are certain things that the marketplace has taken advantage of. Our natural biorhythms, our desire for love and affection, our need for self safety and security, and the marketplace has been able to make money off of that. So I feel bad 
for people who who um sort of wake up at the other end and go, what just happened to the last 20 years of my life? Because they didn't stand a chance. So how do we get them to stand a chance? How do we give them a chance to be thoughtful and mindful about what they're doing? Because frankly, if one wants to be thoughtful and mindful, there's tons of information out there. There are tons of coaches. There's tons of free material. There are tons of books. There are tons of quotes on Instagram. There are tons and tons and tons of information. Tons and tons and tons of information available for people. If they want it, if they know to look. So, um, well, you've made a, 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 a number of great comments there. I, um, this idea of life by default. Uh, you know, you get this, I was, uh, raised with this, you get the education, then you get the job, then you get married, then you have a baby, then you get a house and you retire. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a template <laughs> for life. And right. those are the things you do. Um, and that's a successful life. And aren't you happy? And then if you're not happy, you should be more grateful. And if you're not grateful, then why aren't you more involved with your church and giving back? And, you know, there's just all these shoulds and, you know, routines and, and some people are really cut out for that and it's great and then some people wake up and go no 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 this is a finite experience i need to fix it so thank god there are people that can help them um you you said uh people that have done their work you've referred to that i think a couple of times done their work why don't you uh, touch on that a little bit this i the work that people should do in stepping back and, and choosing a life by design rather than by default. Yeah, great. And and let's relate that to buying a house. Let's, yes, let's please. For you, okay, so so it, when I encourage people to live a life by design instead of a life of default or by default, I think it's um, it begins with their values and who they are when they're in integrity. We can all act out of integrity, and we all do. But when we're being our best selves, we tend to resonate with the values that we adopted as our own, whether they were spoon-fed to us by a community, a church, a school, parents, or we adopted and made our own. So a value for millennials is going to be very different than a values for you or me. They're being raised with the value around climate control and fixing it. We weren't raised with that. We didn't even know about it. It didn't exist. We can, you and I can adopt it. They're getting it spoon fed. So there are different ways of uh, acquiring our value system. So a couple purchasing a home, one would have hoped that they've had time in their courtship and planning for their marriage and, perhaps living together, perhaps having a young child, they would have taken the time to true up their values, know what love means, what does uh, fidelity mean, what does monogamy mean, what does being a parent mean, what is what kind of education, what does it mean to have safety and security, how much money in the bank, do we care about long-term care? Do we have a retirement account? What do vacations look like? Where's our budgets? Where are we comfortable spending money on ourselves? How much money is um, throwaway money? So is it $100 a week per person? Is it $50 per week per person? Like what's, where do we get to play and not be accountable to one another? That Those kind of questions. So when it comes to our home, Knowing our values and behaviors around money and the way we want to raise our children and the schools that we want them to go to and, you know, even down to the cars that we're going to purchase and the clothing we're going to wear and the neighbors we're going to be socializing with. Those things are questions that need to be put on the table because when I work with a couple on the other end going through divorce, what inevitably comes up is that the agreements were not the same. They, they agreed to different things. And typically those agreements are based on values. 
And we assume by default that we were both supposed to have $100 a week to play with. or But of course we were going to have a Lexus and then a Mercedes in the driveway. Or, or of course our child was going to go to private school. Those are assumptions. And the same thing goes with fidelity or monogamy. No, you, you know, one person's agreement is we're going to we're going to be together and true to one another. And the other person's like, well, you know, if I have a one night stand when you're off in the Hamptons all weekend, it's not really a big deal. But, you know, those values are off. So those are the things that need to be trued up together as a couple. And so a home is similar. You know, those, those are real questions to think about and talk about and visit. And what does it mean if we have to put down a quarter of a million dollars as a down payment. What does that look like for our child's education fund, our retirement account, our long-term care? What's going to happen if we're paying a mortgage instead of starting at 27 with a long-term care health insurance policy? What does that look like week to week? What does that look like in 20 years if we don't start paying into that now? So the questions are always way, way bigger than the sexiness and the drama and the fantasy of buying a home. It's kind of mundane and boring, but yet that safety and security is hugely important for the well-being of the marriage. I like to say to people, how one handles money is how one handles emotionality. So if these conversations can't be had around money, the transparency around money, the boundaries around money, the discipline around money, then chances are the boundaries, the discipline, the transparency around the emotional relationship, eh, they're going to kind of mirror one another. Money is a big cause, as I understand it, of divorce. It, the, the ability to get on the same page and have the values that direct money into, you know, uh, mutually appreciated ways is, is hard to do. And, and that was a, an issue in my marriage. And I think that's, that's a, a very common thing. And because it's such a large purchase, money is an excellent example of, of what I'm talking about. But are there other ways that you've seen after the fact how a house, the purchase of a house and the process of coming to some agreement on a very big decision um, undermined a relationship? What does the house represent? What is that house being used for? You know, the best example is you want a happy, healthy home with children that are comfortable and parents that are living within their means. You don't need to go get the $3 million home on two and a half acres of land. You could be happier in a 2,000 square foot cape walking distance to the kids' school, walking distance to the train that gets the commuter rail into the city. It's about uh, truing up the values again with the goals of the family and then looking at what the different options will cost. Look, would I like to have a multi-million dollar home on three acres of land in the country with two cars in the, in the driveway and a pool? Of course I would. But that comes brings with it a lot of management. It's not just purchasing the home. It's managing that home. I always ask, who's going to clean it? Who's going to mow the lawn? Who's taking care of the pool? Who's taking care of the roof? Who's taking care of the basement? How many rooms are in the house? I always look at number of rooms in the house, and I think, how many children are we going to fill to put life into this space? And what happens when we're angry? How much space is there where we can go to our own corners? Where can we hide? Where can my children come in and out when they're teenagers without me knowing? Where's the nanny potentially having an affair with a, house, um, a groundskeeper or potentially having an affair with my child or my husband? Like, I think about those questions. How big am I? What am I buying when I buy this space to take care of? So homes, like everything else, have fantasies attached to them. And 
we have to be really pragmatic. I I have two teenagers now, and I have owned many homes. I, I, I might not be great with picking men, but I'm really good at picking real estate. <laughs> so I'm really good at house hunting and apartment hunting. I'm really good. And I think it's because I take these things into consideration. And I have often thought about during the course of my marriages and um, since thought about having a second piece of real estate as an investment. But I know that it comes with many. I'm employing a lot of people to take care of that space. And what we think about is if you're a stay at home mom with two kids your husband leaves every day to go to work because he has to be able to afford this home and the cars and the maintenance and the taxes, then chances are there's not a housekeeper. Or is there enough money for a housekeeper? You know, these are the questions that really have to be looked at. Now, you said you're good at buying homes, which is interesting. So, And because you think of these things. So if you were to... Uh, walk someone through the kinds of thinking you go through and, and with that context, perhaps a suburban, let's say you're being relocated to Sacramento um, and you're going to look at just a, finding a place for you and, and your kids. You know, what what are the things that are going to be going through your mind as it relates to your values in this decision? Right. So for me, um a commute is a big question. How long is the commute? Do I need a car? Can I walk to mass transit? Is there mass transit? Uh, if I do that, what are the taxes for the property? Uh, my kids are older, so I'm not looking for elementary school. Are they going to the elementary school? Are they going to the high school? Are they going to private school? And what is that balance, right? Property taxes or um, city Taxes affect that. Uh, how's the water? Water is really huge. What's the cost of the electricity to run it? How do how do I heat my home? What are the, what's the cost in that department? Am I contributing to global warming? That's an enormous question these days. How well built is the home? Is it um, filled with asbestos? How's the water system? How's the are there uh, Oil tanks buried on the property. Am I sitting on a, on a, you know, a, what do they call it? Um, anyway, you know what I mean. Dirty, dirty land. Uh, what am I up against? Who are the neighbors? Those are the kind of questions that I look at. How well is the roof? How, when was it last serviced? When was the boiler last serviced? How are the appliances? How old is everything? Mm-hmm. I'm going to look at everything from the construction to the community, to the neighbors, to the commute, to the um, the community. Are, are there churches? Are there temples? Do we have a vibrant social community? Are there homeless? You know, this is this is where I'm going to be raising my children. Um, so for me, for example, when I thought about taking a home in the suburbs. So I live in New York City proper. And there would be no way that I would live in a community that, A, I couldn't walk to mass transit. There's no way that I would drive a car every day to and from Manhattan because of traffic. So somebody living in California, one of my big concerns about California is uh, I personally couldn't justify sitting in traffic wherever I went. So I would have to be close to mass transit and how good is the caliber of the mass transit. So those would be very top of mind for me. The next question always is, is the quality of the school system? Because if I'm paying taxes to support a school system, is my child going to come out uh, ready for college or am I going to be pulling them and putting them in private school? And then what does that look like? So those are really top of mind. Then it would go to the quality of the home. And that's interesting. The, the quality of the home was, uh, aside from, I think you mentioned some appliances and the roof perhaps, was really not on that, that list. The, you know, how, how pretty is this box? How pretty is the neighborhood? Wasn't. I didn't, I didn't even do the pretty, did I? No, I you, you, you didn't even. None of it mattered. 
<laughs> no, pr- pretty wasn't on on that list. Uh, uh, appliances was probably the closest you got to pretty, which is which is important because when people um, begin to shop, uh, they they and you know I, we do a what I would refer to as simply a comparison shopping. So if if you're going to go buy a TV. And uh, you're going to go, at least the way I do it, I start learning about TVs. It's kind of a, it's a project. It's kind of fun. It's exciting. It's the thing I want. So I'll learn what are the features uh, that that are now available and which of them do I want. So I might start making a list of the qualities in, a, in this item that I'm looking for. And then I start comparison shopping. I go look at a bunch of TVs. You can do this online, which is, is wonderful. And you can, you can start comparing all of the, the features that you want and, and look at reviews and then compare them to another one and compare them to another one. I find when people are shopping at homes or for homes, they end up very much focused on the box, the house itself, which is comparing, well, that had bigger bedrooms. That had a great kitchen, but a small backyard. And the focus is is simply drawn away from that list you just gave to um, the the qualities of each particular house and how they compared to the one before or others that they liked. And it's really a matter of stack ranking and picking the best of those boxes. And all these other qualities um, are not part of that process. And, and it, my argument is what all those things you just described, those things that are important to you, like a commute, you know, and, and the schools and all of that needs to be done as that early work and without yes. even looking at the boxes. And yeah. Yes, 100. I was going to say the same thing. All of that, all, the community has to be selected and the uh, boundaries. So, yeah, like, and that, that costs more money in, in this part of the world, right? If I need to be on a commuter line to New York City, that, that limits my options. But, and also, then there's the balance of, well, I want to be near a commuter line, but I don't want to hear the train. Right. So or I need a view of the ocean, but I want to be a commuter line. That's going to limit the town. So these are these are part of that pre thinking before you go look at how pretty a house is or whether or not it has a porch or whether or not a porch can be put onto it or like that. Well, getting um, um, you say it's going to cost more money. It's uh, if you are working with a a limit which most people are. There's there's an amount that they should stop at, and that's actually the pre pre work is figuring out what mm-hmm. you, what territory you shouldn't go into. But if there is a limit, then it's a matter of prioritizing, and and you're not just going to spend more. You're going to have to give something else up. So if you want to be close to the the uh, public transportation, but not so close you listen to it, um, those are probably uh, prime properties in some respects, so it's it might be a smaller property. It might not have as many bedrooms. It may not have, you know, when I was growing up, we kids shared a room. My brother and I shared a room. That's almost unheard of these days. In fact, most most young families uh, they want an extra room. You know, they want an office, and and so you give up things for everything you one thing you want. You have to compromise in other areas. And, and that's what you're talking about. So it's a matter of now prioritizing what are the things that are most important and what are you willing to give up for them? Yeah, again, buying a home is a really thoughtful experience and it can bring a couple together or it can show where their values are completely different. And when somebody compromises in a big way on, on the purchase of a home, therefore, or maybe really compromising on their values, that sets up a structure, a foundation with cracks in it. I talk about that a little bit. I think that, that that's a really big topic right there. Well, for example, um, thankfully, men and women are different. And women might say, I really, really, really want a house with X, Y, and Z. And he goes, I can't afford X, Y, and Z, but I want to make you happy. So we're going to make it work. Well, all of a sudden now, what he's done is he stepped into his DNA encoding and is providing and protecting. He's building a family structure. He's going to go for it. But what we don't know about is how well constitutionally 
he can handle the stress of taking on more, which I'm a big fan of stretching. Believe me, I'm an enormous fan of stretching when it comes to finances because you are saying to the universe, I'm going to step into being bigger. I can do it. But we have to make sure that he, and I'm, I'm using very stereotypical he, she um, pronouns right now, understanding that there are lots of combinations. But um, when somebody takes on something enormous, where's their support structure? Is she being supportive? Does she understand? Is she taking a part-time job? Is she working herself? Uh, is she willing to do the housekeeping for a while? And are they, more importantly, are they willing to stay in communication? Because what I have found is that when life is really great and sex is really fun and the hormones are going back and forth and everybody's in a great space, it's easy to talk. But when things aren't going so well, when you don't have sex every single night or three times a week, and he doesn't have the release and the opportunity to talk. And she doesn't realize that she needs to sit there and talk. And he, you know, oh, when all that starts to happen, the foundation of their relationship starts to get cracks in it. And the stress can build up. And then they begin questioning the decisions they've made. And that's the communication piece. And typically, if a couple is in relationship by default, they don't know that that and I and I like to say communication, but really what it is is courtship. It's the courtship of the couple, the courtship of the relationship, the courtship of the family structure, the husband wife dynamic that has to continue. And we don't realize that nobody ever talks about that. You still have to court your partner. You still have to be curious about your partner. You have to still be in conversation and communication with your partner about where your values are and your needs and your desires and staying, keeping that vibrant and keeping that alive takes real effort when the hormones aren't ricocheting back and forth. And we don't know how to do that. We don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. The um, example you just gave there where one person wanted this and this and, and, you know, the other partner said, I'll step up to that. I'm, you know, I want to make you happy. I want, um, uh, let's say someone hasn't made that decision, but they're heading down a path where, where they're not really in an alignment and someone's feeling or may feel like they're sacrificing. Um, how would you counsel people to, to, to start talking, to be able to get to that? I mean, do you have suggestions that would help a couple while they're going through that process, perhaps to prevent some future um, disaster. So I had a teacher who used to say, you have to accelerate toward embarrassment. You have to make the courage to have the conversation. That's it. It's very simple. You must make the courage. You must accelerate toward that conversation. You must sit down, get through that yucky feeling, put it on the table and talk about it. And you and just say it here. I'm I'm feeling like this has a risk associated with it. This is a yeah. lot. This is a lot. And again, it's a financial conversation, isn't it? it comes down to finances. Yeah. yeah and if you can't have that conversation, what are you going to do when you say, I've got the huts for the girl in the cubicle next to me. Well, I haven't had sex with you for six weeks and she's flirting with me. What are you going to do? If you can't have the conversation over here, how can you have the conversation over yeah, that, there? That makes the conversation about money seem easier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And the thing is, is by default, we don't, we're not, we don't realize that we, it's our responsibility to keep this intimate relationship um, vibrant. Again, I'm going to step back a minute. Everyone thinks divorce is normal. It's easy. We can just go through it because it's everywhere. So why not? Like, this is just what we do. You know, we have an affair, not have an affair. We can break up. We can sell the house, whatever. No big deal. <laughs> but it's deeply, deeply personal. It is so difficult to go through. And we don't recognize the fact that it's so much easier to work on a marriage and 
work on communication and true up values than it is to go through what people go through with divorce. And I teach a couple of workshops around this because I always teach a workshop on values and purpose to, to young people, like 20, 20 year olds, college graduates. I really, I really talk to them because if they don't know who they are, then they're going to fall in love with the next pretty thing that walks their way and not have a clue what they're getting into. And, um, I talk to men. Um, I've done a workshop called, uh, um, pre overcoming premarital jitters or how to be monogamous in the day of internet dating, which again talks about values and being thoughtful about the life that you're designing. We're not taught how to be in marriage. We do it by default. Consequently, we're certainly not taught how to do divorce, though there's more and more information if one wants to know about that, just like if one wants to learn about marriage, typically it's taught through a Christian perspective. But the institution of marriage comes from a religious context. So that makes perfect sense to me, the history of it. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be dealt with and we do it by default. So, you know, sometimes I have clients that think they want a divorce, but what they, they but they don't really want a divorce. So then I work with them on uh, growing within their marriage and improving their marriages. So, you know, buying a home could be that experience with a a real estate broker or a real estate agent who is in integrity, quite aware of the consequences of taking on more than a couple can handle and accelerating toward the embarrassment and broaching the conversation. That would be somebody I would want to work with. If someone wanted to, to get in touch with you, um, either on the life coaching or divorce coaching uh, side of things, how would they do that? Well, I'm easy to find. I'm all over social media, and I have a website. My website is laurabonarigo.com, and if you can't spell Bonarigo, that's okay. Uh, look for Laura Bonarigo, the way you spell it, uh, divorce coach, and you'll find me. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Twitter. That's how we met. Yeah, I think that's how we met. And um, I also uh, have a lot of articles that are being picked up by other um, companies that are linking material. So I'm really quite passionate about what I do, and I'm really passionate about helping people live the life that they really want to have. And so um, I'm happy to talk to anyone, whether they're going through divorce or not. And I work with a lot of young people. And, um, you know, it'd be my pleasure to, if anyone wanted to reach out. My website is filled with articles that I write. So uh, everything's mine. So they're ha I'm happy to share uh, anything like that. Great. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all the best and stay in touch. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us on the Surviving the American Dream podcast. If you found this helpful, please leave a comment and share with your friends or family, and especially anyone looking to make their home happier.